Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a very important conversation with Ligia Brooks tonight. My name is Michael Zwingenberger, and I'm the executive director here at America House Munich. Um, I'm very much looking forward to a lecture by Lisha Brooks on truth and liberation, Black Lives Matter, and the legacy of the civil rights movement in the US. And the topic um, that we present tonight is very important to us here at America House. We have presented many young US artists working on Black Lives Matter and civil rights history in our gallery space, and we have organized numerous talks and lectures on these themes, also dealing with voting restrictions, incarceration of young black men, the criminal justice system, and social justice. But Ligia Brooks is our first speaker in a leading position at the Southern Poverty Law Center, one of the most important centers on civil rights issues um, in the US. And Ligia Brooks is the chief of staff of the center, so it's great to have her. A very warm welcome to Ligia Brooks, who came here from Alabama, and we are really happy to have her. Um, thanks. And I'm also happy to welcome Elizabeth Horst, Minister Counsel for Public Affairs at the US Embassy in Berlin, who brought Lisha Brooks to Munich. Not actually um, coming the same way, but you are here now, that's great. And our moderator for tonight is going to be Professor Dr. Andreas Edges, historian here at LMU Munich, where he regularly teaches seminars on the civil rights movement and American politics. And um, the Southern Poverty um, Law Center, I'm sorry, Southern Poverty Law Center, was founded in 1971. I was just um, calculating in my head um, how many years the anniversary was that just took place last week, but it was the 50th anniversary of the Southern Poverty Law Center. So it's great, and I think we will hear more about that anniversary in a couple of minutes. And my last duty tonight is to um, inform you that we will open the Q&A session to the audience, and you just need to um, insert Slido, S-L-I dot D-O, and then you need to enter the hash America House, hashtag America House, and then you can participate in the Q&A session. And now Elizabeth Horst will also address you. I think we will have a wonderful and interesting evening. Liebe Maike, liebe Gäste, herzlichen Dank für die freundliche, einführende Worte. Mein Name ist Elisabeth Horst. Ich bin gesandte Botschaftsrätin in, für Presse und Kultur in der US-Botschaft in Berlin. Und ich habe das Glück, dass ich heute hier in München zu Gast sein und dürfe hier äh, bei dieser äh, hervorragenden Ver Veranstaltung mitteilen. Vielen Dank, liebe Maike, liebe amerikanisches Haus, Team für die übergehende Zusammenarbeit. Das, was Sie hier machen, zusammen mit unserem Konsulat, ist wirklich hervorragend und wir weiß, wissen das zu schätzen. Und natürlich danke ich auch sehr herzlich äh, äh, Herr Dr. Edges für die Moderation heute Abend. I'm going to switch to English now, so that our guest will also be able to understand. <laughs> Diversity, equity and inclusion are top priorities in the United States, in the government, and both in our mission to Germany and I don't think that's a secret why. The United States is still struggling every day with prejudice, inequality, and, just, and injustice. And for Americans, this is tough because we were founded as a nation of immigrants. But even that uh, statement is a bit problematic because many Americans had no choice to immigrate. They came as slaves. So the idea of America as a fundamentally immigrant nation starts very problematically, and it's something we haven't quite come to terms with. The United States clearly has work to do, and even though we're not perfect, we are working to form a more perfect union. As we strive to improve, reflecting not only on American, on American society that is diverse, inclusive, and just, we also have to acknowledge that the environment in, lift we, in which we live is constantly changing. We have to ask hard questions and deal with difficult truths about our past. We need to make space for new voices and new ideas. And sometimes some of us just need to shut up and listen. Most importantly, the struggle to understand and reflect requires lasting, constant, and critical reevaluation of ourselves, the way we work and live together, and the way we communicate. It also means we have to work diligently to identify and counter our own racism and bias and take concrete steps forward. But I don't want to be overly negative because the United States and our government is really taking concrete steps to root out and dismantle 
existing institutionalized racism and deep-seated inequities at all levels. It starts with holding ourselves accountable to the highest possible standards, to having strong commitments to diversity and equity and inclusion, acknowledging our continued challenges and biases and dealing with them transparently. President Biden has been very clear that the United States will always support dignity, equity, and freedom around the world. And his upcoming democracy summit is a part of that fundamental belief in the power of people and the power of democracy. So we as Americans, and clearly in our discussion tonight, want to foster a, na a national and even an international conversation on equality and diversity. And I hope we can use this conversation as a means to demonstrate that the fundamental democratic ideas so important to the freedoms we enjoy. This American approach is vital to healing the wounds of our past, but honoring the contribution of all of the people, regardless of race, sexuality, gender, or background, and echo our promise that despite all the painful parts of our history, and frankly our present, we can and we will change. Mike has already uh, introduced our guest speaker, Alicia Brooks from Alabama. We are so delighted to have her back here in Germany. She's chief of staff of the Southern Poverty Law Center, which really is one of the cornerstone organizations in the United States working to counter racism, prejudice, anti-Semitism, and all kinds of hate speech. She provides counsel to its senior leadership, helps with strategic planning, and works with people from across the organization to assure its success. She's an expert on civil rights, Black Lives Matter movement, diversity, equity, and has traveled across the United States and abroad to speak about hate and extremism. Alicia, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us your expertise and, and perspective. Without further ado, the stage is yours. I will wait until you're seated. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I really, really appreciate it. I want to just take this opportunity first to thank you, Director Swigenberger. Was that correct? Thank you. <laughs> and the America House, I appreciate you. Thank you to the U.S. Embassy, Ms. Hortz, and thank you, Dr. Eckes. Thank you for serving as a moderator for tonight's discussion. My name is Leisha Brooks. I use she, her pronouns and serve as the Chief of Staff at the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. Many people refer to Montgomery, Alabama as the birthplace of the Civil Rights Movement. Certainly most people in Alabama or in Montgomery refer to it as the birthplace of the Civil Rights Movement. The Southern Poverty Law Center was founded in 1971 as a civil rights law firm committed to working to ensure that the sacrifices and achievements of the modern American civil rights movement became a reality for all particularly for black folks living in Deep South states. Our early work involved bringing successful civil rights litigation in Alabama to force the state to honor the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You'll forgive me um, as I kind of just recount a little bit about the Civil Rights Act because I find that people often reference it but don't know really what it was. Under the act, segregation on the grounds of race, religion, or national origin was banned at all places of, a pub of public accommodation, including courthouses, parks, restaurants, theaters, sports arenas, and hotels. No longer could black people or other minorities be denied service simply based on the color of their skin. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 dismantled what is known as Jim Crow segregation. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act barred race, religious, national origin, and gender discrimination by employers and labor unions. It also created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission with the power to file lawsuits on behalf of aggrieved workers. The act also prohibited the use of federal funds for any discriminatory program authorized the Office of Education, now the Department of Education, to assist with school desegregation and prohibited the unequal application of voting requirements. The legacy of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and those who helped bring it about are two major follow-up laws. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, 
which prohibited literacy tests and other discriminatory voting practices. That might surprise you, what with the voter suppression being all the rage in the US currently. It also brought about the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which banned discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of property. Though the movement to secure civil rights for black people was hard and long fought across the Deep South, the former states of the Confederacy were not persuaded to equivocate on their belief in white supremacy and its hold on power. This was, of course, true, if not immediately transparent, all across the US, not just across the Deep South. So SPLC founders who were born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama, two white men, to be clear, who were born and raised during the Jim Crow era, decided to start the Southern Poverty Law Center and use litigation, education, and other forms of advocacy to push for racial justice. The SPLC began tracking right, white supremacist activity in the 1980s during a resurgence of Ku Klux Klan and other organized extremist hate groups. Today, the SPLC is the premier U.S. nonprofit organization monitoring the activities of domestic hate groups and other extremists. In the early 1990s, the SPLC launched Teaching Tolerance, a program to, that provides educators with free anti-bias classroom resources, such as classroom documentaries and lesson plans. Now renamed Learning for Justice, our program reaches millions of school children with curricula and other materials that promote understanding of our nation's history and respect for others, helping educators create inclusive, equitable school environments. SPLC lawyers have worked to shut down some of the nation's most violent white supremacist groups by winning crushing multi-million dollar jury ver verdicts on behalf of their victims. We have helped dismantle vestiges of Jim Crow, reformed juvenile justice practices, brought down barriers to equality for women, children, the LGBTQ plus community, and the disabled and work to protect low-wage immigrant workers from exploitation. But we didn't do any of it without the civil rights movement. The Southern Poverty Law Center founded in 1971 after the civil rights movement. Now in our 50th year, the SPLC is a catalyst for racial justice in the South and beyond working in partnership with communities to dismantle white supremacy, strengthen intersectional movements, and advance the human rights of all people. We continue to be inspired and encouraged by the courageous and resilient women, men, and always the youth who continue to push this country, the US, to be an inclusive democracy. SPLC commissioned artist and architect Maya Lin to create the Civil Rights Memorial. It was dedicated in 1989. It tells the story of the movement beginning in 1954 with the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education. The memorial chronicles the major events of the movement, including the Montgomery bus boycott, the integration of Central High School by the Little Rock Nine, the Freedom Rides, the March on Washington, the Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March, all of these major events of the movement. It also names and honors 40 individuals who were killed along this timeline, the timeline being 1954 to 1968. The first named martyr on the memorial is Reverend George Lee. He was a minister and businessman who lived in just a little small town called Belzoni, Mississippi. And Reverend Lee preached about voting rights and he encouraged his congregants to register to vote. Klansmen found out about his activity and encouraged him, strongly encouraged him to stop. He would not and he was murdered because of that. He registered about 90 people before he was killed. The memorial also marks the killing of 13-year-old Emmett Till, NAACP Field Secretary Medgar Evers, 
the four little girls killed in the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church. Viola Liuzzo, a white woman who transported black marchers from Selma to Montgomery and ends with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. The civil rights movement as SPLC's first president, Julian Bond, offered should not be reduced to the false narrative that Rosa sat down, Martin stood up, then white folks saw the light and saved the day. That is not what happened. Bond tells us that people, ordinary people, came together, strategized, and pushed back against an oppressive system. They did, they did this repeatedly until it became a movement. This is true for all movements, and all movements are connected. Time, you see, creates a trap around legacy and personal contribution and an attribution for success. And it makes it seem like one person did one thing that led to all these other things. We know historically that is just not true. Every great movement leader, everyone involved in movement building and their actions were and always are tethered to a broader community of people, both in the past and in the future. Movement work is not tethered to a destination. It is ongoing. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s is a history of those who refuse to be discouraged. It is a history of the fight for civil rights. Civil rights being, meaning, the rights guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution, as articulated in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. These amendments abolished, abolished the institution of slavery, mandated birthright citizenship, guaranteed the right to due process to all persons, and established the right to vote without regard to race. These rights have been central to the demands of black folks in the U.S., and they are always, or they have always been, accompanied by calls for economic and social justice. The successes of the civil rights movement are connected to a legacy of demands by black people in the US for equal treatment. Today, many have held up the civil rights movement to harsh critique and produced a very distorted history. Pictured here, images from the Montgomery bus boycott, Little Rock Nine, the March on Washington, the Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March, and the sanitation worker strike in Memphis. It's important to note, civil, right act, civil rights activists, including Dr. King, believed in the necessity of disruption to highlight and transform unjust policies. Oop. Oh, I went ahead. That's, that's the BLM one. Thanks, doctor. <laughs> Act like you didn't see it when it comes up next time. Uh, and even though movement folks during the, during the civil rights movement wore, quote unquote, respectable attire and rooted their protest in God's love and the love of country, they were routinely chastised as being un-American and unreasonable. The movement was not unified as to tactics and approaches. Ella Baker comes to mind. Early in her activism, she worked for the NAACP and the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Ms. Baker became frustrated by the tendency of the NAACP and SCLC in particular to focus on a single charismatic leader, Dr. King. She was also frustrated by his reliance on marches and boycotts. She thought they could do more. Baker became inspired by youth activism that was taking off in, the, in South Carolina where students were boycotting classes. And in Nashville, Tennessee, where students were training in nonviolence with Reverend James Lawson. And in North Carolina, where students were staging lunch counter sit-ins. In Greensboro, North Carolina, 
four black students at a historically black college decided they would sit in at the, at the Woolworths lunch counter until they were served. College students from nearby schools quickly joined. On the fourth day of their sit-in, three white women joined. And on that day, white teenagers waving Confederate flags began to harass the student protesters. Ella Baker knew that few of the students that were thrust into leadership had any preparation for their new roles. So she borrowed some money from the SCLC and hosted a conference at her alma mater, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Baker and Martin Luther King Jr. co-signed the invitation to student groups. The conference was to be held in April. Ms. Baker assured the students that they would be in charge, that the conference would be youth-centered. More than 120 students from 56 colleges and high schools attended. The students not wanting to be co-opted into existing older organizations set up a temporary student nonviolent coordinating committee, SNCC. SNCC student leadership organized a fall conference in Atlanta in October of that same year. The invitation sent to student groups said it would be action-oriented and declared the following. Truth comes from being involved and not from observations and speculation. We are further convinced that only mass action is strong enough to force all of America to assume responsibility and that nonviolent direct action alone is strong enough to enable all of America to understand the responsibility she must assume. There had been sit-ins before, to be sure, but suddenly one had caught fire and spread beyond Greensboro. Julian Bond, our president, who also participated and was a member of SNCC, uh, later opined, the sit-in demonstrations provided a technique through which traditional patterns of white oppression could be attacked by ordinary people, not lawyers or ministers or social scientists. The sit-ins represented a tactical change from earlier boycotts or lawsuits. It was a confrontational activity, and yet they were orderly, peaceful, and skillfully organized by students. Between February 1960 and February 1962, thousands of lunch counters and other facilities in 150 southern cities were integrated either by nonviolent action or the threat of such action. Over 7,000 people went to jail, and over 100,000 people had actively participated in this new movement. Tactics that we now associate with Black Lives Matter and identify as unapologetic and radical echo the tactics used during the Civil Rights Movement, and especially those of SNCC. Peaceful, nonviolent protests, taking a knee, taking up space, being seen. Stretching back even further through history, in 1905, W.E.B. Du Bois convened a group of black folks in Niagara Falls, New York, to form the Niagara Movement. It grew to develop 39 branches. Du Bois outlined a program he believed all American black people should try to pursue. In part, he said, we must complain. Bluntly complain. Ceaseless agitation, unfailing exposure of dishonesty and wrong. And in the 1920s, Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican immigrant to the U.S., built the largest and broadest mass movement of black folks, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. It was a counter to the interracialism of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The UNIA had more than 700 branches across 38 states. 
and more than 200 branches outside of the U.S. Garveyism represented psychological liberation from the mental slavery imposed by white supremacy. Garvey said, the world has been, no, the world has made being black a crime. I intend to make it a virtue. Black Lives Matters did not emerge from nowhere, though it may feel that way because of the effective and resonant messaging. If one were not paying attention, you could believe that BLM came into being post the horrific public lynching of Mr. George Floyd in 2020. Heinous crimes do capture the attention of people. The same thing happened during the civil rights movement with the lynching of Emmett Till and the deaths of four young black girls attending church in Birmingham when a Klan bomb went off. Black Lives Matter is a movement. Black Lives Matter is a philosophy. And Black Lives Matter is an organization of independent organizations. At its core, BLM sounds the alarm and proclaims that the lives of black people everywhere really do matter. BLM was birthed in response to the 2012 shooting of Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager in Florida, and the subs subsequent acquittal of his killer. After the verdict acquitted the killer, Alicia Garza, already engaged in political organizing in California, and this is important to note, the founders also didn't just appear, but she was working um, for um, primarily house, housekeepers. Um, she wrote a Facebook post about how she was feeling after the, after the verdict was announced. The series of posts titled A Love Letter to Black People expressed her love for black people and black life, even as it seemed our country didn't. She signed off with Our Lives Matter. Two of Alicia's friends and comrades, Patrice Cullors, also an activist for years in California, and Opal Tometi, an immigration activist, responded with the tag, hashtag, Black Lives Matter. The messaging and tag circulated to hundreds of thousands of people across various social media platforms and the movement took off. It's important to remember and honor the work of these three black women. A hashtag doesn't organize, give life to, or sustain a movement. Three black women did that hard work. In 2014, in response to the fatal shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown by a white police officer, Black Lives Matter mobilized tens of thousands of people to produce large protests in Ferguson, Missouri, and other cities across the U.S. BLM created a template for how individuals and organizations could strategically and impactfully assemble folks of all races and show that, indeed, Black Lives Mattered. BLM's ability to organize and mobilize sustained protests and influential messaging in the U.S. and globally is a testament to the BLM movement leaders and also a testament to those who came before. While I am deeply appreciative of what, a, of what Black Lives Matter has done and continues to do with respect to asserting the humanity of black people globally, I am so grateful for what BLM has done to bring black folks together all across the diaspora. In the US, it looks like being reminded, black folks being reminded, that we really do mean all black lives matter. Oop. Let's go back to the other one. Note, that's what they mean by we are an expansive movement. Trans, non-binary, queer, hetero, women, 
children, men, rich, poor, formerly incarcerated, currently incarcerated, immigrant, veterans, formerly educated or not. BLM has done what movements of the past have not been able to pull off, explicitly and intentionally creating a big tent for black folks. Black Lives Matter not only reaches out to all black folks, but they also affirm that in all of our complexity and individuality, we are black and we are loved for all of who we are. As a lesbian identified and now older black woman, myself, I simply cannot express how important and special it is to be affirmed. To intentionally work to counter all the negative stereotypes about black people is another BLM gift to black folks and others. We are not inherently dangerous. We are not ignorant. We are not lazy. We are not less than. We too are human beings and deserving of love and respect. BLM is indisputably a global movement. I've had the distinct honor and privilege to engage with many black Germans, including those associated with BLM. Sadly, the stories are the same. State, san state sanctioned violence against black people, over policing of our communities, housing, health and education inequities, lack of economic opportunities, I'm excited about what we can do together to bring about change. It should be easy for a black person, or as easy, for a black person to move anywhere in the world, thrive and be safe, as it seems to be for most white folks. BLM's focus on policing is well understood at least by me, though it's very misunderstood with the broader public. We're trying to stop the killing and over surveillance of black people, period. There are ways to keep communities safe that don't involve armed police response. Oops. I'm just going too fast, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the SPLC is trying to learn from the movement and its leaders. We are being a lot more intentional about how we do our work and how we use our megaphone to uplift and support the movement for black lives. We're also helping teachers understand what Black Lives Matters is and what Black Lives Matters is not. If you think the pushback to teaching critical race theory is fierce, try talking, uh, talking to school districts about teaching the principles of the Black Lives Matter movement. Our new podcast, Sounds Like Hate, used its first season to talk about what happens when a school raises a Black Lives Matter flag in solidarity. You can only imagine, and this was at a white school. I'd like to leave you with this quote from Dr. King. He really does provide a quote for any occasion. Think about this, please. The ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. I offer this because just the, the post-George Floyd um, events and protests that really saw a lot more people than ever participate in Black Lives Matter protests really was and is confusing for me. Because I saw that, or I see that, or kind of these things that, these big heinous events that take place 
and everyone's opportunity to say how wrong it is, I see those as times of comfort and convenience. I see every other day as times of challenge and controversy. I was driving through um, Georgia a couple of weeks ago, and I was just really amazed, because this, this is not true in Alabama, but <laughs> in Georgia, people still have a Black Lives Matter signs on their lawns, and these are white neighborhoods. And I wonder, what are those people doing every day? I appreciate the sign, I really do but I wonder what more can be done. I hope to see you out there challenging our systematic racial oppression in the US and abroad, challenging the vestiges and the foundations of white supremacy that exists globally. It's not solely a US, it's not just the US but it's everywhere. And as we look at demographic shifts, I was talking to somebody earlier about demographic shifts in, the, in Germany. And I, as I understand, maybe so a lot of people don't see you as a, as a country of immigrants. Not yet. But your demographics have shifted pretty dramatically over the last decade. And they will continue to shift. As you know, BIPOC people are a majority, a global majority. So we're in this together, and I, I welcome the opportunity to serve with you. Thank you. Oops. Okay, well, thank you um, very much for, for these introductory remarks, which I think also, I mean, you also raised a lot of questions, and um, um, so it's not just me raising questions, but I'll, and I think I'll also try to, to um, see whether you have at least some answers uh, to also the, the things you raised, and as was announced, you can, um, people can send, um, oh, the math, sorry, of course. This is better. Um, people can send questions, and I already received some questions, and we'll also try to uh, include them while we um, while we go along. Um, one thing you you didn't mention, but I think, and I I, I don't want to want to leave this out, and that has been on the news, not just in the U.S. but here as well, is the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, trial in, in Wisconsin um, that, that people followed closely, um, where, where a young uh, white man and a situation where, where, where there were protests uh, against racial injustice and violence and counter protesters armed, um, where uh, he shot um, several people, not just African Americans, I think two white, white. he shot two white people. And um, there was a major trial that was also observed closely here. And um, there was a lot of criticism of the judge, but he was just acquitted. Um, um, Josh Horwitz, the executive director of the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence, was quoted in the New York Times the other day saying, quote, only in America can a 17-year-old grab an assault weapon, travel across state lines, provoke a fight, kill two people, and injure another and pay no consequences, I think one should add, only a white. Exactly. <laughs> um, I don't, do you want to, um, and do you want to say a little bit about that trial and also maybe the, 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 the signal that's, that's sent from, from that trial, what you, what you fear or expect from? There's a, there's a lot there to unpack. I'm glad that you mentioned the judge, who I thought, let me just say for the record, he was awful uh, and exhibited his bias throughout the trial. So there was, there, there, was no, there, was, there was no question whatsoever that 
Kyle Rittenhouse would have been acquitted based on the judge's behavior. But secondly, I would say that certainly that that the quote is true. It, it's it's a sad um, state of affairs in, in the U.S. with respect to gun violence, but also it's a the series of events with that involve law enforcement and people who who are engaged in anti-democratic practice. The fact that if we can go back to the protest where Mr. Rittenhouse um, killed two people, he was there protesting peaceful protests, right? And so he was engaged in anti-democratic process. He came armed looking for a fight to disrupt what was going on. Law enforcement did nothing but encourage him. So there are so many, there are so many errors all along the way. And it's, and of course didn't start in, just in Kenosha. We've had incidents across the country, most notably in Portland, Oregon, where law enforcement turns a blind eye to armed aggressors who come out specifically to protest racial justice, uh, uh, racial justice protests. So people wonder, like, <sighs> wonder why some groups are able, some people are able to get away with this kind of activity. Let me just say for the record that no one should, no one should be engaged in violent activity. It's also important to note that Black Lives Matters and racial justice protests, the vast majority, I'd say 98% are nonviolent. So the fact that um, Rittenhouse comes to this protest expecting it to be violent and continuing to push that narrative, that false narrative, that Black Lives Matter or racial justice protests are violent, and he is there to protect property. I mean, there's so much wrapped, there's just so much wrapped up in it, right? You, you, <laughs> you cross state lines to protect property. What are you doing at home to protect black lives? Mm -hmm. Or what are you doing at home to, to protect people, you know, more broadly? Apparently nothing. Um, it also encourages other bad actors across the far right and in between. I mean, you don't even have to be an extremist at this point to, to be encouraged to pick up arms and, and, and shoot and claim self-defense. Um, this, this theory of self-defense hasn't worked for black people. Black women, I mean, I don't even know the names, but I do know the stories of black people who have, have discharged a weapon in self-defense who were sent to prison. Um, this goes back to um, Trayvon Martin in Florida where, where his killer claimed that he was acting in self-defense. So but that also has to do with something I think we, we don't really have in the legal sense in Germany that you have these stand your ground stand your laws ground. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. self-defense. Um, can you can you say a little bit about? I mean, you you already said what the consequences are, but just to explain it maybe a little better to to also a German audience, what? It feels to me like stand your ground laws and that's on the state level, right? On it's the state, yes. Some some states states have a law that's called stand your ground that you can you can defend yourself if you feel threatened, if you feel some sense of fear. And that allowed Zimmerman to shoot, to shoot and kill Trayvon Martin, even though he was the aggressor. Um, but for me, it goes back to the whole institution of policing. And if we look at, if we look at the history of the US, policing grew out of these vigilante groups that were um, attacking uh, black, black people, newly, newly emancipated black people, and for me, stand your ground laws connect to those because they allow um, people to continue to operate under the presumption that black people are dangerous and guilty of something, right? If not guilty of something, you are dangerous and I have a right to defend myself. It's also a way to ensure and protect gun rights and I'm not as, as well versed on that, but for me, it, it's, uh, it's a license to vigilantes to engage in mob violence. 
Um, now, a major part of, of your work that you briefly discussed is, is identifying and then working against hate groups. Um, how do you define hate groups and how do you then, then decide on what, what are the issues and what are, what are the groups that you um, also then name publicly with, with a lot of effect, of course? Well, the Southern Poverty Law Center has its own definition for hate groups. We identify a hate group as any group that demeans or dehumanizes a group of people based on their immutable characteristics. That's it. Um, we don't, groups do not have to have engaged in any violent activity, but based on their leaders, what they put out in terms of their publications, what they say, if they demean and dehumanize a group of people based on who they are, we identify them as a hate group. Now, um, when we started in the 80s, we were completely focused on the clan, on clan groups, and then it was called Clan Watch, but we've since extended to all sorts of hate ideologies. The, the um, largest um, hate group, and we do, we conduct an annual census every year and identify the active hate groups that exist across the U.S. So for 2020, we identified 838 hate groups, active hate groups in the United States. The ide ideologies span the gamut, but I would say the vast majority are white supremacists in nature. Um, white nationalist groups are the, the fastest growing group. There are also neo-Nazi groups, neo-Confederate groups, um, anti-LGBTQ groups, anti-immigrant groups, uh, and the like. Um, white Lives Matter is identified as a hate group. Black Lives Matter is not identified as a hate group because Black Lives Matter does not demean or dehumanize a group of people based on who they are. And um, I mean, I, I think, and you, you already implied this, you have, you have broadened the definition of the issues, I think also, uh, yes. and that, that's, that's one thing. Um, what, what if, and of course, the, the Trump years have been observed very closely here. Have you, have you clearly seen a spike in those years, or what have been the major changes in, is it the size of groups, the, the issues have, even though you say violence or committing violence or our asking others to commit violent acts uh, is not um, kind of a necessary part of that definition, but have groups become more ready to use violence? That, yeah, that's an interesting, um, interesting question. With the growth of hate groups, the last real spike in the number of kind of physical hate groups, which are declining, to be clear. 838 for 2020, prior to that, it was higher. The highest spike in the number of actual physical hate groups occurred under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. So that was a reaction to a black man holding the highest office in the land and people kind of felt like they had to organize and, and, and take back their country. Under the, Trump, under the Trump administration, the number of actual physical hate groups went down. That being said, people who, who have some kind of hate ideology or traffic in, in that kind of ideology did become emboldened under the Trump years. It, it really started during, um, during, um, during his campaign when he began to you know, openly dehumanize Mexicans and you know, uh, Muslim, the Muslim ban and all of that. So that really, um, that really was a, a, we call it a wink and a nod to extremists or white nationalists in particular, um, it, really did, it really did make them feel like they had their guy in office because he continually parroted white nationalist speaking points. He fam famously said, you know, at the, after the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally, that there were good people on both sides, which of course there were not. We, we are in trial right now, you may know, that um, some of those um, the people who organized the Unite the, right, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017 are uh, facing civil trial now. A group called Integrity for America is bringing suit against them on behalf of uh, individuals who were victimized. And you recall that one person was killed during that event. So during his time, they had safe haven. Um, now they do not. What, what we're also seeing a growth in is, is the online organizing. People do not have to join physical groups anymore. Um, hate groups are becoming more diffuse, and um, 
and really organize online if they need to join a group at all. There's so much information that people can, um, can gather online that they don't need to join a group. You'll remember with the, um, Dylan Roof who, who uh, massacred nine African Americans in South Carolina. He didn't belong to a hate group at all, but he found out all he needed to know about the white nationalist agenda to create a white ethno state from websites that he visited online. They told him that um, something needed to be done about, <laughs> about black people. And so he did what he, what he thought they were asking him to do. So this is, this is, this is very, very, very dangerous and very, very um, concerning. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center has been engaged a lot in with working with the federal government around, you know, kind of we're having these Senate hearings on, on um, internet platforms and their responsibility around um, monitoring their sites in, in, in more responsible ways. All of the major social media platforms have um, as part of their own independent terms and conditions that there'll be no you know, hate online, but they don't, they don't um, implement those terms until something happens, right? So then after January 6th, insurrection on the, on the US Capitol, um, you find, you find uh, social media platforms or, or, or saying that, okay, no, we're not gonna do this, and they're kicking people off site. But then you have the phenomena of the dark web where even if they're not on Facebook or not on Twitter, there are so many different platforms where they gather privately. Um, so it just, it, it it's, it's kind of feels like the whack-a-mole kind of thing. Like you find them in one area and they pop up in another. Um, um. And then when you, when you designate, uh, just to understand also the work oh, of, yeah. of the Southern, uh, Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center, so if you designate a group as such, I mean, it might lose funding, right? It will be outed in a way or make more prime. What, what else is being done with? What do you and what do others do with the... Well, we, um, we originally kind of started this hate group count as a, uh, to provide a, a service to law enforcement and Homeland Security. So first and foremost, we want to give law enforcement and Homeland Security information on who's out there. Um, the US government cannot monitor and track individual citizens, but pri private citizens can, so that's what we do. So we provide the intelligence on um, who, 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 you know, who's in charge of this group, what elected official is associated with this other group. So, and we publish a lot of um, materials outing people. So it doesn't, the, the funding thing um, only comes into play if, if, they're, if they're some kind of official. Typically, these hate groups don't, um, and hate group members don't have a lot of money themselves. Um, recently, they have been moving to monetize their, their platforms and selling, um, selling information, you know, online videos, that kind of mm -hmm. thing, but mm -hmm. um, they don't have a lot of money. As, as you know, um, in Germany, Nazi symbols are prohibited and, um, um, and the argument is, is also that, that, you know, they have been, uh, used and used for crimes in history. Now, should there be similar restrictions for, for um, uh, even Nazi symbols are being used by some of the uh, white supremacy groups in the United States? After all, you could argue you also have a long history of, I mean, not the type of extermination that, so it's comparison doesn't mean it's, you say it's the same, but you also have a long history of racism, race, racism crimes, hate crimes. Now, people like Noam Chomsky, who's also well known here, has, has publicly, and many people haven't understood this, defended even the right of right-wing groups um, to protest. A uh, quote from him, if we don't believe in freedom of expression of people we despise, we don't believe in it at all. Are you fully with Chomsky, or would you like to see I, some more restrictions? And I have, you know, I grew up in, in, in the U.S., in U.S. culture, and, in, and so you know, raised to believe in freedom of expression and free speech. And I do understand that, that if we start curtailing speech that we don't like, then the next day speech that, that, that works for me or that I'm engaged in will be curtailed. We also know 
um, factually that when we start implementing these kinds of laws, it's people of color who are, are first are the first ones to 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 be monitored. This this happens in, 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 with the over surveillance of black communities. I mean, this happened with the um, black identity extremist group kind of um, um, hunt that that happened under the uh, Trump administration. So or, or it happens a lot with gangless. Like no. So I believe in freedom of expression, and I don't believe that I don't believe that um, the government should keep information on who's engaged in what. That said, I do think that the government should use our resources and the, and the resources of the Anti-Defamation League to identify um, threats to our democracy. The thing, the thing that we saw in, in kind of just perfectly laid out at the January 6th insurrection is that our democracy is at, is at stake. So it's more than just protecting free speech or or you know, or or the the right to bear arms. It's our democracy in general. There's so there's such a um, a push and a move to authoritarianism, and this you know really did, did did take off under the the Trump administration. But it continues. There's there's still that. There's still there's still that. They it's like it's like some people want an authoritarian leader. So anyway, back to your question. I no. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with Mr. Chomsky on that. Mm -hmm. Although I admire his work greatly, mm -hmm. um, I would say that that to be clear, anti-Semitism <clears throat> is also on the rise in the U.S. I mean, it's it's something that's been on the rise globally, mm -hmm. and certainly, um, it's our belief, it's my belief that anti-Semitism animates white nationalism. And if it weren't, if if it weren't for anti-Semitism, and people didn't so deeply believe, weren't so deeply anti-Semitic, um, the white nationalist movement would have nothing. Um, white nationalists believe that Jews are controlling everything. They blame it for the civil rights movement, for the gay rights movement, for, for all of it. So it's, it, it, is, it is incumbent upon us to fight anti-Semitism just as strongly as we fight, um, racial just, right, fight for racial justice. Yeah. Uh, a lot of questions I already received regarding Black Lives Matter, so I'll, I'll ask some of those questions and then um, maybe also come back to some of, of the other issues. Um, has the, one question is, has the emergence of Black Lives Matter changed your work as SPLC? For example, did it help in engaging more people with your work? That's an interesting question. I think it's changed the organization internally. I know that it's changed the organization internally. Um, we've had, um, like many companies and businesses in the US, we're forced to look at um, our own kind of practice of white supremacy culture. And though the, the SPLC has always done great work, we didn't, we didn't necessarily reflect what we believe in. And leadership at the organization for the first 50 years was led by three white men. Now it's a much, much different organization. There are a lot, there are a lot more people of color. I don't know that people of color are the majority quite yet, but um, it's really informed how we do the work and who, who leads the work. So when, when you have um, people from diverse backgrounds leading the work, it will lead you in a different area. In, in different ways. So. Mm -hmm. um, there is, um, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, also briefly mentioned um, that you try to educate teachers or try to get it on, on the school curricula. Um, and the question here is what is the greatest challenge is when you try to educate teachers, but the one big challenge might be to even get to yes. the teachers in the first place, right? Because of school yes. boards and, and state. Yes. I don't know if you've been following it, but this whole kind of backlash against um, critical race theory, and to be clear, critical race theory is not taught at the K-12 level. It's can not you, can taught. Can you maybe say a few words about what that critical, means? Critical race theory was something that was um, um, developed by lawyers in, in grad school um, professors to talk about, show how racism was systemic. 
that it was institutional, that it was beyond just personal prejudice, but it was something that was embedded in the U.S. system. And so it was, it was taught at the graduate school level and, and, and in law schools to help um, make that case for, for why inequalities and inequities continue to persist. There was this big uproar about critical race theory, and now um, school board meetings are places where, oh my gosh, such ugliness is coming out at school board meetings. And some states have already uh, passed laws preventing their schools from teaching critical race theory, even though they know it's not taught. But it's a way to, to not teach about Black Lives Matters, to not teach about um, LGBTQ issues, to not teach about women's rights. It's all of it, and that's what people tend to, tend to miss out on um, or, or leave out of the equation, that it's not just that you can't teach about institutional racism, but they don't want you teaching about anything that has to do with truth, so. So is that part of a larger backlash that you see? I mean, now you, you've mentioned, and I'll come back to, and there's also a question about the Biden administration. I mean, to some degree, if we, we you talked about the civil rights movement, um, I think one could argue that the, the nonviolent um, civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, in some ways, maybe in a perverse way, profited from the violence of, of um, the other side and the pictures that went out in, mm. in the news and, and into the world. And there mm. was what was called massive resistance against school um, desegregation um, and, and, and other attempts to, to um, dismantle this. So. Um, would you you argued I think and one one could say this that Black Lives Matter is a strong and very committed movement but if one looks at the history of how change was brought about you you needed a sympathetic federal government hopefully a president who on, at least on some level helped um, Congress you needed the courts sometimes the Supreme Court was even ahead of like, maybe even the debate in in society uh, and and then in spite of that massive resistance which back in the 60s was more, or 50s, 60s was more the Democrats in the South. Mm -hmm. Now kind of the parties have mm -hmm. changed. Um, if you look at that today, so the courts, the federal governments. Um, yeah, it's really sad. Um, but but let, me say, let me say this one, or make this point, that sure, there was, some, there was tremendous benefit um, to have to creating kind of sympathetic support when you think about the images that were projected out. Now, and that was new, right? And it's important to remember that, that you know, <laughs> photography and news and pictures, mm -hmm. that, was, that was completely new. Prior to the 50s and 60s, and even in some areas, those, the, 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 the iconic images that we see went out for I don't know, maybe a dozen major events. But there were these other ongoing movements and demonstrations where black people were, were beaten and you know, um, their movements were, 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 were squashed because the, the resistance, the white resistance was so strong, it was so hard. And the fact that, that we go from 1954, if, if you go with just our timeline, um, 54 to 68, that's a long time to, to demonstrate and protest and, and boycott, right? So people weren't immediately sympathetic and they weren't consistently sympathetic. It really required people staying, people staying out there and refusing to back down and then people feeling guilty. Now, the thing about the sympathetic, sympathetic president Johnson wasn't sympathetic, nor was Kennedy, right? To, to be clear, they were, their hand was forced, right? Um, and you look, at, you, look at, you, look at, you look at Congress, you look at change, power concedes nothing without struggle, as you know, Douglas said. And people and their sustained efforts to demand change created change. I don't believe that it was because um, there were sympathetic people. 
people, Johnson, uh, uh, by the end of it, couldn't stand King, right? And, and Kennedy, I like Bobby Kennedy better than, than President Kennedy in terms of advancing a racial justice agenda. President Kennedy. Later, later on, not yeah, necessarily yeah. when he was Attorney General. Yes, I yes, think. yes. So mm. it's, all, it's, all, it's all a rather mixed bag. Um, but what is consistent is that people, the people, <clears throat> you know, work to create the change because they didn't, they didn't give up, they didn't stop. And that's what I think we're seeing or can see in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I was looking at, I had that slide up about defund the police and I was looking at some recent research that showed, um, did it really work? Did, did law enforcement agencies defund? Some did. The cities that had the largest, most consistent protests during racial justice protests are the ones where the cities reduced their, their police budgets. Places that had little or no protests, or maybe one and not a lot, in fact, <laughs> increased their budgets. So the, the power of people, I believe in the power of people to create change. And I think that um, it's a good reminder to us that it's important for each of us to show up at these events, right? Um, and that's what happened post George Floyd, remember that? I mean, that was just like, that was so reminiscent of the civil rights movement when people came out again and again and again. And in Portland, 100 days. I mean, people showed up for um, long periods of time, and that hadn't been done since the civil rights movement. We show up, you know, for the Women's March annually, but we don't show up every day. I was surprised that at least for a while, looking at uh, public opinion polls in the U.S., that at least in those polls, more than 50% of the American population said they supported the goals of Black Lives Matter. Um, I, I, those numbers have gone down a little bit again, but I was really positively surprised. I mean, whatever that means, and that doesn't mean activism, but just to accept the fact that this group, the demands of, of, of the many groups that make up Black Lives Matter are right. right? Yes. Yes, no, and that's very encouraging. And the majority was four from white people, right? And I want to be clear about that and, and have white folks understand the power that, that comes with, with, with being white, right? And you can move public policy. Post-George Floyd, things began to happen immediately because white people made them happen. Um, the the um, leaders of the Tops in the military decided that finally they would change the, the 10 names of military bases that are named after Confederate heroes. We saw companies, Aunt Jemima changed their thing. Um, um, the NASCAR, which is a huge thing with, with white Southerners, decided that they would no longer allow them to fly the Confederate flag. I mean, these things people did on their own, mm -hmm. just on the strength of what happened, what they saw happen with their own eyes to, to Mr. Floyd. Right, and what what we need to what we need what we need people to understand is is that this kind of thing sadly happens with or without a video capturing it, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what yeah that's what we need because mm -hmm. certainly we don't want these horrific events to to be uh, the constant catalyst for change. Mm -hmm. When are we going to recognize? and believe that it's happening. We, we saw post-COVID where um, it lay bare all of the inequities with respect to race. People saw that as a real learning opportunity too. So. You uh, just mentioned the, the um, Southern Confederate memorials and flags. That was another instance where, I mean, there had been some which one, I mean, not all of them were built right after the Civil War, That's quite right. the opposite. Several came up during, you know, in, at times when, when even before the kind of main phase of the Civil Rights Movement, when people were active in defiance, then, then flags were changed in the 1950s and 60s, again, as a defiance, new monuments were put up. But then the fact how quickly they came down now That's right. and were That's discredited right. in a way. Um, so the memorial culture, not just in one, and you showed a picture of your center, so I think in the last 30 years, especially in the American South, that you've seen a lot of memorials, monuments, museums that celebrate the civil rights movement. Um, 
um, but the other monuments remain there. And now so many of them have come down so quickly. And so I think that's, that's an irreversible change. To a that's certain. wonderful. That's another thing, uh, uh, um, part of SPLC's research. We have, we've been researching Confederate monuments and put out a report in 2016 was our first report after the, the massacre in Charleston. It's a report called Whose Heritage? And we cataloged all of the Confederate um, monument, or icons to the Confederacy, monuments, memorials, street names, parks, school names, everything that's named after the Confederacy. And we saw more things come down post George Floyd than in the years, all of the years combined. There was some activity post Charleston, and then that died down, and then there was some more activity post Charlottesville, and that died down. But it was incredible, incredible. Mm -hmm. But still remains you know, 18, uh, about 1,800 um, symbols of the Confederacy still remain. Well, we, ha we have had a lot of <laughs> name changes in this country and monuments that came down and we're still working on it. Uh, yeah. uh, and we've been going on for this for many decades regarding all the, the Nazi uh, mm -hmm. monuments and symbols and, and you know, even, even the military installations. Then, of course, regarding East Germany. Now we're finally starting to look at our colonial history mm -hmm. and trying to, to deal with that. And so we both have a long <laughs> way to go, I think, yes. on this. Um, yes. Um, when we, when, when you mentioned, I, I, I would um, see at least Johnson and, and, and Kennedy in the end a little more positively than, than you, maybe <laughs> really fighting, fighting for that. But, but that brings me, and while I can't see the questions right now, to a question both, both in the past and today, namely the international perspective and, and what, what, what an international audience or support, solidarity, or whatever plays in that. Now, some people have argued and that to some degree, and I think just that that is partly true, that the fact that the United States was in a Cold War and where it was teaching freedom and liberty to others while 10% while, um, of its population was, was unfree, many couldn't vote, that that also played a role for, for the federal government to, to work on that. Um, but the question that, that someone raised was also, so to what degree is Black Lives Matter um, um, also a global movement? And how, how important, you, you touched on that, how important is it that, I mean, there were, I was, took part in a demonstration in Berlin, there were demonstrations all over um, mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. So how, how important is, is the international? I think it's that? critically important. I mean, when we talk about, as I mentioned, the, the stories are sadly similar. And so it's, it, it's easy for, people, for, for, for black folks who are in any part of the world to be able to relate to what is coming out of the U.S. from Black Lives Matter activists. And they have been, I think, I think they have helped bring um, a certain gravitas to, to, to the whole subject. I think that our... Often our leadership is is influenced and impressed by whether or not um, world leaders seem to have some interest in the subject matter. Mm -hmm. It could be because, um, as was the case with the U.S. post World War II, it wasn't. <laughs> they didn't decide on their own. Like, oh yeah, that's they they fought. We should be. We should we should treat them with equality. No, it was because they were embarrassed and and they wanted to. Um, redeem um, our reputation across the world. So I think that we're very, um, our leaders continue to be very influenced by what other world leaders think about us and what we are doing. So, mm -hmm. and I think and to not be completely negative, I mean, I do, I do, I do believe um, President Biden has done so much in you know, just a short period of time with respect to um, advancing um, some, of the, some of the calls from the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and just the fact that he says it, and you know, he, I, I believe that he's generally, genuinely concerned with racial justice. And I, yeah, so sometimes it happens. We can, we can, we can, we can get there. Mm -hmm. But if you look, I mean, on the other hand, look, looking from here, and I'm sure in the U.S. too, there's a lot of frustration also oh, yeah. with the little progress, also with, you know, the big hopes. There's 
new government, there's democratic majorities, and then of course not all the Democrats agree oh. on everything, and then, you Such know, there's... Mess. Such a mess. Well, I mean, I don't know. You think people would have learned during the Obama administration a president can't just implement everything they want, right? Um, and I, I, again, I mean, Biden, you know, he started off with all his executive orders. I, I don't know what, I think he's done what he can. He, of course he could do more, but you know, he, it's, it's one branch of government. You mentioned the, the judiciary. Oh my God, that's, that's the really scary part right now. And voting, voting rights. I mean, one of the big achievements where one would have thought this is now done, right? right. When, I, when I, I regularly teach um, classes on the American political system where we read the Constitution and look at voting and, and you know, how things have changed. And what really amazed me, um, or the, w the way then I understood it, that in the U.S. you, you never really had something in the Constitution that, that in a way says everyone has the same voting rights. It's one one group after the other that shouldn't be excluded anymore. So it's quite the, you know, the thinking is, is really the other way around. It's mm -hmm. not everyone has a universe, you know, of, of a right. certain age has the basic right to vote, period, and that cannot be infringed upon. No, you know, you cannot be, your voting right cannot be taken away because of this or this or this state. Um, and, and which is happening again with, with, with all kinds of means. And is, is that, how are you fighting against that, and what are, what are the options that you can be successful? It seems like, uh, and again, both parties have had a history of, of restricting voting rights, and in, in up to the 1960s was mostly the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. uh, until they changed under Johnson and Kennedy, especially, mm -hmm. to become also the party endorsing civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, but how afraid are you of that? Because that could, I mean, that, that really pushes things back to... It does, it does. It's also, um, it's a great organ, it's a great thing for people to rally around in terms of organizing. If you look at the um, 2020 election and the, 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 the election of um, Reverend Warnock and Senator Alsop in Georgia, I mean, people don't like to, to, to think that you're taking, black people, don't like to think that you're taking away their voting, voting rights. And it really does galvanize and inspire people to come out. So sometimes it could have the opposite effect. So we're doing, the Southern Poverty Law Center is doing litigation at every turn, which we, we don't know how that's gonna end up because of the judiciary. We may not win, so we have to use, utilize different tools. So we're working with community groups in building their capacity to organize at the grassroots level and engaged in voter education and voter, um, voter registration year round, not just during presidential elections and really trying to get people to understand that they can, they can lead their communities if they turn out and vote. Mm -hmm. And that really is, that requires an education. There's so many people who, who um, opt out of, of voting that it requires, it just requires like conversation, hard work, you know, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood to bring people into the franchise. It's, so you have, you're, you're battling voter suppression, but you're also battling uh, voter apathy. You have a whole generation of people who don't even believe that um, their vote can make a difference at all. And, and if they do vote, they're so discouraged and dismayed by what happens, then they won't ever vote again. So we know the research shows that if you can get people to vote, you know, we're doing a lot to automatically register people when they get out of high school. If, if people vote young, early, they'll vote, they'll there's a greater likelihood that they'll be lifetime voters. So we're trying to build the base and still file lawsuits when, when necessary, mm -hmm. but we have not, have not been very successful of late mm -hmm. in the litigation. And much of that, just to explain, was, was based on a major Supreme Court decision that basically declared major parts of the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional, yep. and while things might still be, that are being done might be unconstitutional, you now have to fight them in court. Yes. Before that, these states wouldn't have even allowed to change the voting laws the way and they That's because done. Justice Roberts said that it's gotten better. We don't need, we don't need these restrictions anymore. And as soon as, as soon as the Voting Rights um, Act was gutted, states immediately um, began to pass and implement voter mm -hmm. 
voter ID laws and restrictions. And people say, well, what's the difference? I don't know what you, do you all have we to do show have, ID? We do have, uh, that's why I asked my students, so how do, what do you need to vote? You, get, you, you need <laughs> to have the, you need the ID and basically the, the letter you get and then you can vote. But you, mm. yes, you need the ID, but everyone has an ID here. Yeah. You're registered automatically. You don't I have see. to register. I see. Yeah, no, we don't. We because don't. here our government, we allow our government to know where we live and thereby we are automatically registered. Mm. And, uh, mm -hmm. We're not, and people, people always say, well, you should have ID, but people don't. Elderly, people living in rural areas, um, people of color, young people, so. Um, now, someone needs to tell me which program button I need to press in order to get through the questions, because they disappeared here. Um, um, but one, one thing, t I mean, voting rights, if we, or not just voting rights, you cannot do it on a racial basis anymore, as it used to be, right? What do you, you mean? You could, you could keep certain people. Oh, oh. So, so it has to be framed in voters, secu make, make sure that no one um, votes illegally well, or other things. Well, you can still do it by race because you can, you can target your yes. efforts on, say, for instance, in I, I was purged from the rolls, right, uh, a few years ago few years ago. So state governments can decide, oh, this particular voting precinct, um, there's some irregularities here and we're gonna purge all the all the voters in that. And that and that's what happens and that's how you can keep it kind of race based. Or you can you can oh, the, the effect clearly, but yes. you cannot put it in under allowed to put that's it in right. language, or you can do it for partisan reasons or whatever, which but will But because hurt. we're so hyper segregated, we live yes. such hyper segregated lives, um, it's easy to do. Then there's also the notion of we're going through redistricting, where government maps out voting districts where people can vote, and the, the districts are typically created. They're not like a block. It's not like a map where it would make sense. Oh, this is, this is District A, this is District B. They'll be like all winding around trying to pick up a, a certain demographic. And so that's why um, you may have heard more recently that people are really concerned about redistricting and losing power mm -hmm. um, because the way the maps are, dr are, are drawn. Um, a question, now that I can see them again, fits with that. You mentioned the recent attacks on voting rights from Republicans. Do you believe that they succeed to such a degree to make a second Trump term more probable? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I believe <laughs> I believe that Trump could be reelected without any voter suppression. I mean, that he had an amazing number of votes. Right? Yep, that's a sad reality, and his voters show up. Um, Whereas, I believe that there are, you know, kind of more people who um, want inclusive, who, who believe in an inclusive democracy, but we don't show up. His people will show up. Mm. Um, now, you, you already talked a little bit about, about Biden. Another question here. Do you think the Biden administration is doing enough to combat institutional racism? and to fight far-right extremism? If not, what can be done better? Hmm. Well, I think I spoke to the institutional racism earlier. There's certainly, you know, kind of more that he can do. But then again, like, he's the president and there are three branches of government and he can't, he can't, you know, I think he's gone as far as he can um, with, with his, um, what do you call it? I just had the word. The president. Executive orders? Yeah, thank you, with the mm -hmm. executive orders. <laughs> um, but other things require legislation, which require, you know, the other branches of government to cooperate. Um, and then as far as, well, what was the second part of that? Um, what can be done better um, or far, fight far-right extremism? Oh, far-right extremism. Yeah, I don't know that, I don't think he's doing enough there. I don't think I don't think he's as educated as he could be um, about what's going on and the, the very real threat from the, from the far right. Um, so, I, w I mean, I think that there are people within his administration, certainly in the Department of Justice and in, in the FBI, who, in the FBI in particular, who rec recognize the threat coming from far right extremism and have for some time. So I would encourage him to, um, I think that people, 
including the president, might think that it's hyperbolic, but it's very real. Mm -hmm. um, and so he needs to move from a more reactive posture to a more proactive posture in terms of meeting the threat. And it's going to require a lot. One of the things that, that the Southern Poverty Law Center is doing, and because we recognize that it can't just always be about um, arresting folks and criminalizing folks and behavior, especially because there's a lot of young people that, that um, have fallen down the rabbit hole of, of far-right extremism. So one of the things we're doing is beef, beefing up our resilience programs, which I know that in Germany, you all have been doing that for some time in terms of, of um, trying to bring people bring people back, de-radicalize, mm -hmm. de-radicalize young people. So that's something that, that, that we're paying closer attention mm -hmm. to. And so I don't think that Biden knows anything about any of this. Mm -hmm. Well, we've also had, def in a negative way, defunding of those programs in the last oh. administration. And, now, and there has been, you know, because the, I, some of the right-wing problems were underestimated, I think. We don't uh. need all that money anymore in uh. the education. I, that's, I think that's, that money is coming back now. Uh -huh. um, so much, another question. So much power in the U.S. is exercised at a state and local level. What needs to be done to see more equity and diversity in local governments? That really is up to individuals, and, and all of it is up to individuals, so this allows me an opportunity to get on my soapbox about individual responsibility. Um, we are responsible like for the state of, 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 of our DEI efforts, our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. What are, what are we doing, right? Um, sadly, the, 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 the results or consequences of white, of white supremacy impact people um, in such a way that we believe that, no, um, we need to be, they, they need to serve us, they can serve us, white folks should be in charge. I mean, you can't get some people of color to vote for other people of color because, because of the internalized um, oppression that's, that exists. So it really is up to us to believe in us and to believe in the power of us and start electing more diverse leaders. I think that we're doing that. We saw the first Asian woman um, mayor in Boston. Um, we're seeing we're seeing a Just lot the of Biden administration too. It's the most yes. And I, I saw a great. I think it was either the BBC or some British newspaper that had pictures of uh, of the administration, and they put those in color that were people <laughs> of color. And I really like that. Because yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It's up. It's up to us. It's up to us. Um, the uh, question going back to the civil rights movement and other social movements in the 60s, um, they show deep interconnection, for example, with the anti-war movement. Um, mm -hmm. What is the history of the SPLC in this regard? The w interconnected with other movements. Um, I mean, now, now and, and when you talked about Black Lives Matter, the women's movement and others, was it, was it for a long time more exclusively focused on civil rights? In the yes, I mean, the, the founding was to kind of rectify some wrongs that were seen across the Deep South, and it, and it had mostly to do with the de de dis disenfranchisement of, of black folks and poor white folks um, across the Deep South. That has certainly expanded. Um, we do a lot of work in the area around immigration and, and migrant rights. There are... Um, there are a number of um, detention facilities across the Deep South where um, people, immigrants or migrants, are deported to these areas that nobody even knows where they are. And we have offices that um, work to represent them, not only at the border, but also in their immigration hearing to, to make sure that they're not deported. Um, we've done, been doing a lot of work recently with Cameroonian um, immigrants who are being mm -hmm. <laughs> instantly deported. Oh, this is another thing that, that, that Biden needs to do. The, the whole thing about the Haitian immigrants that he sent back immediately, like, oh my God, what? <laughs> what are you doing? Or, and the whole immigration issue um, entirely, I think he's, he needs some support with that. I don't, it's not going well. But I think that's for, for your society and ours here in Europe are some of the most challenging issues, right? How to deal with that. And, 
climate change and many other things that will, will lead to even more um, migration and um, right. people, for understandable reasons, trying to get a better life for themselves or right. their children risking their lives coming there. And we have, uh, I don't know if you read about that, we have these, these clashes and, and that's been partly used by Russia and Belarus to yes, let people in that. and the clashes at the port. I mean, Germany yes. sometimes, is, we aren't directly at those borders. So, you know, Italy or Greece or yeah. Poland has to deal with this, um, but it, it, the, these are major challenges here as well. I understand, uh, I understand. So. I, just, I, I just don't understand why we have to um, confine people in detention while we figure it out. And criminalizing movement is, mm -hmm. is hard. Um, I have one more question here and then maybe a, a final question. Mm -hmm. um, how active and influential are religious groups in America in regard to the goals of Black Lives Matter? Well, that's an interesting question. Good question. These must be your students. <laughs> <laughs> this one was anonymous. There were some of my <laughs> students. <laughs> um, well, as, as you know, historically, the black church was, was the backbone of the civil rights movement. Um, they've been less, um, less eager to participate in Black Lives Matter. And, and again, it's that thing of not understanding or believing the false narratives about what Black Lives Matter is or isn't. Um, people just, I don't know, tend to believe that it's a violent movement and it is not. It, it, it is not. I mean, all the research shows that, that any violence that is broken out at Black Lives Matter protests were, were, were brought about by people, outside agitators like, you know, our friends from, from Kenosha or something, or Proud Boys, or people coming in to intentionally disrupt um, and create, create violence. So churches, church leaders have ten, tended to believe that um, it, it's that they're violent and they don't participate to the degree that they should. I think we're seeing more, you saw I had one of the images of um, some, uh, um, I forgot what you called them, um, Mennonites who were having up mm -hmm. signs about not, not killing black people, stuff like that. that. And that at the very least, yeah, religious, religious leaders should be on the front line um, with that message. Whether whether or not they align themselves with Black Lives Matter or not, mm -hmm. um, but they but they but they should. Mm -hmm. But we don't see it as much as as we would like. No, mm -hmm. you know the civil rights movement was um, not just led by black black church black clergy, but really became an interreligious kind of place. I mean, by the time you got to the Selma to Montgomery march, you had all of those when when King called um, mm -hmm. the clergy in to help with that second march. You had people of every faith, and Black Lives Matter should be able to, to draw on that same audience. Mm -hmm. But, no. Okay, final question. Um, I mean, I'm a historian, you, you touched on history, and then, then looking back, for example, at police violence, it seems um, you know, it's coming back again and again. I've, I've found some, some great cartoons from the 1960s that discuss police violence, the, uh, part of the the the, um, the reason I think why the Black Panthers and the American Indian Nation were founded also mm -hmm. had to do with with um, being raided by police, mm -hmm. being stopped, mm -hmm. and that that mm -hmm. injustice. Um, and it's happened again and again. You mentioned a few cases when Obama, on the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery marches, uh, on uh, stood on Edmund Pettus Bridge, the bridge where where the civil, the, those people protesting were, were, were beaten down and tear gas was used on them in Selma, Alabama. He stood there on March 7, 2015, talked about police violence that was still happening in places like Ferguson. And um, he also said he had been asked, so what has changed? Has anything changed? Um, I mean, yeah, um, he, he argued it's wrong to say nothing changed. It would deny the agency. You must be frustrated also with, you know, you see it seems to be an uphill battle whenever you think and there's the first black president and then there's the pushback. <laughs> then you have someone like Trump being elected. Now you have Biden. And again, it seems to be a struggle that's not ending. So what would be your answer to that question? Has, should, should one look and, and or, is there progress or is there more the frustration of? I think there absolutely is progress. 
Absolutely. I mean, the very fact that, that we can talk about these things more openly, that people can come to the, co the conversations authentically, that, we, that there was a conviction. Again, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not the person that wants you know, to push for further criminalization of anyone, but the fact that we got a, a conviction uh, in the Chauvin trial, was, it's incredible. That's progress right there. I mean, that never, ever happens. Um, so, and, and not just that, but, the, but as I alluded to earlier, the fact that so many people, and white people in particular, came out in support and, and, and stood up and said that that was wrong, I mean, that's progress. Um, all of, the, all of the, the progress that we saw uh, with respect to, to companies and corporations and the US government, the changes that were implemented and put into place, you can't go back on that kind of stuff. The fact that people are now um, really concerned about diversity, equity, and inclu inclusion, and even if they're not, they feel obliged to, <laughs> to you know, make it a part of the program, it's, it's, it's progress. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's tough to experiencing it, but to experience it repeatedly, but it also, you know, helps to remember that, you know, the foundations of white supremacy in the U.S. are so solid, right? And the country was all built on it. I mean, it just, it's just permeates through everything. And so to break down and dismantle everything is gonna take time. Kind of like what you were saying about the monument. It's just, it's gonna take time. Um, but we have made tremendous tremendous progress, not to mention, you know, uh, C Vice President Harris, I mean, that's progress too. Um, yeah, black senator out of Georgia, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot, there's, there's, there's a lot to be hopeful about, and I think the more, we, we just know that we can do more, we can do better, um, and we have to do better. I think that's a great <laughs> final word, right? <laughs> we, there has been a lot of progress, but we still have to do better, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of challenges mm -hmm. out there. Well, thank you so much thank for you. coming and sharing your thoughts with us and discussing with us. Oh. That's great. Thank well, you. Well, thank so much. you, Professor. Look, your students are lucky. Is he good in class? <laughs> thank you.